سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي طاهر الزكي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We'll be continuing from where we left off uh, yesterday uh, So for anybody who wasn't uh, here uh, yesterday what I decided to do over the few days that we'll, I'll be uh, presenting um, just few days and then maybe a few days in the coming week or before the end of Ramadan is to present a little bit from uh, this work of a 17th, in the common era, 17th century uh, scholar from Yemen, from Hadramaut, by the name of Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad, and spoke of his Nasa'ah uh, Diniya, the advice, religious advice on religious matters, translated very ably by uh, Abdul Aziz Ahmed, um, a section a bit on worship. So I'm presenting just uh, over these few days uh, the section on uh, fasting and uh, Ramadan, inshallah, and we discuss on Ramadan specifically. So yesterday we had um, begun by talking, just uh, reading through the opening of uh, the author, Imam Haddad. Um, there had been a request to maybe give a little bit of a biography. Um, so very, very briefly, especially for, I think much of it was actually said yesterday, but for those who were not in attendance yesterday, uh, Imam al-Haddad was born in uh, 1044 of the Hijra, uh, so roughly speaking about 400 years ago, um, in 1634 of the Common Era, to descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, both on his mother's side and his father's side in Hadramaut. At age three, uh, as we said yesterday, he fell very ill and lost his sight. And his parents and others of the wider family, uh, this is a, a, a family that had descend, that had uh, immigrated roughly in the fourth century of the Hijra um, to the Yemen. And, uh, again, all descendants uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu And so they were concerned that he should follow in the uh, footsteps of his ancestors as of being a, somebody of knowledge. Um, and somebody of a uh, spiritual uh, suluk, of uh, way for spiritual wayfaring. And so with losing his sight, they were concerned that he would not be able, especially the scholarly side of those two activities, would not be able to fulfill it. And it turned out that they had nothing to fear. Um, as he lost his sight, even his teachers, at a very, when he was at a very young age, noticed that he actually increased his fervor for knowledge. Uh, for the learning of the Qur'an, for the words of the Prophet Sallallahu and generally speaking throughout his youth and his teenage years for the various saloon, different disciplines that were studied in his age. Um, he performed the Hajj when he was um, about 25 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, about 32 years old. Um, and it was around the time of his performing the Hajj that he wrote the work that we're reading now. So he had written part of it just before he left. Uh, including the part that we're reading now. Um, uh, when he went on the Hajj and went on the Umrah, he read the work in a congregation of scholars and ulama in front of the uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is uh, at this point that his renown around the Muslim world uh, began with ulama mentioning that this work uh, that we're reading here today is a work of great effort that, that distilled all of the various um, most important points from Imam al-Ghazali's Yahya al din um, uh, upon returning back to uh, Tarim, he established a mosque and a, uh, his own home at the edge of the city of Tarim in Hadramaut in an area named Al Hawi. And this area became the center of his da'wah. Uh, he would travel to the various villages uh, around uh, Hadramaut in, in Yemen uh, and would call people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and would teach his own home and he would teach in, in the mosque, uh, again, that he had uh, built next to his home there in that area, a mosque which still stands today in his mihrab where he used to uh, pray, um, still stands and people go um, to pray there and to visit. Um, he was a person of, uh, as one can imagine, as one would have to be uh, to do that task, which is to dedicate oneself to calling people to Allah. He was a person of 
uh, renowned for his uh, easygoing nature, a particular, a particular concern to widows and to orphans, uh, despite being somebody who, again, as a, uh, blinded from a very young age, faced his own great challenges, but he put those to the side always to serve uh, others. Uh, one anecdote that's given is that he's, uh, he had somebody, obviously, with, with having to travel around as he did, dedicating himself to Dawah, he had a person who would help him as he was blind. And uh, you said that this was a man who you really couldn't shake. Um, you couldn't get, get him angry, very little that you could do to, to ruffle his feathers. Um, but there was one incident in which apparently something that this uh, assistant of his did, which did um, get him slightly worked up, and immediately he uh, got a grip of himself, and within the, uh, almost immediately thereafter gave his servant a gift to placate uh, and to also teach himself that you know the, ant the antics of the nefs of the ego are not to be tolerated. So his servant jokingly said, I, I wish that he got angry more often. Uh, and, uh, I don't get these gifts enough uh, for, on the basis of his getting angry. Um, so just to show the way that uh, you know, somebody of his stature would be, uh, you know, always teaching not just by words and by opening up books, etc., but teaching by his state and implementing the sunnah of the Prophet and who himself had taught that when a person has any, uh, you know, feels anything in their heart against somebody else, that you should go out of your way actually to teach your ego, to teach your nafs, um, and to do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from just what's in your heart, let alone what it might have manifested on the tongue or on the limbs, uh, to give them a gift or to do some other act of kindness uh, to them in order to set uh, the wrong straight. And to, most importantly, not allow the ego, the nafs, to get accustomed to being able to just have its way all the time. Um, so, point being, he continued on uh, for some 40 years thereafter uh, in this very simple life, dedicated to Allah, dedicated to knowledge, dedicated uh, to teaching, um, until he, he met his, uh, his Lord um, uh, in the years of uh, Muhammad. I forget the exact year of his death at the moment. Maybe I'll give me a moment. Perhaps we have it here. Yes, in the year 1132, which is the year 1720 of the common of the common era. So, with that brief uh, review as to the author and uh, the uh, the book, Chalo will continue from where we left off yesterday. So, we were, we had stopped towards the end of the section, which he was talking about the blessings of Ramadan. And again, as mentioned yesterday, the reason uh, that I had chosen to read this particular section is that it's very easy, especially in the middle of the month of Ramadan, to fall just into habit. Um, you know, in the beginning, the first few days, the, the intentions usually are very, very clear. The himma, the aspira aspiration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very high. And then as the days go on, especially in a northerly clime like England's, in which the days are 19 hours or 20 hours, it's very easy to just get worn down and fall into habits um, of fasting, of praying, sleeping, eating, and then doing it again the next day without really reflecting upon what it is that we're in the midst of doing. So I thought this might be a good time to um, you know, take benefit from what Imam Haddad has written as to the benefits, blessings, um, and as we will see today, the etiquettes and the traditions of the Prophet regarding Ramadan and the fast. So where we left off yesterday, uh, Imam Haddad, may Allah have mercy upon him and benefit us through him and through you, he says, and he, upon whom be blessings and peace, the Prophet said, Whoever fasts the month of Ramadan and prays the night prayer with faith and sincerity will have his prior sins forgiven. Uh, Iman and Wahtisab. And here the Imam al-Haddad says, Iman here means believing. So we fast with, in, not just as a habit, not just because it's good for our health, not just because it helps us maybe lose some weight or whatever it might be. All of these things might be true. And indeed there's... Um, some excellent work that's been done over the past five or six years about the benefit, I mean, not by Muslims um, uh, particularly, but in medical research as to the benefits um, of fasting. Um, but out of faith, meaning whether that research is done or it's not done, whether we, we see any immediate health benefits or we don't, whether it clears the mind or it doesn't, this isn't the point. We trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when He says that everything that that he has prescribed for us is for our own good, and we believe in this, whether we understand the particulars of it uh, or not. 
And so Iman, he says here, is with believing, and ihtisab, Imam al-Haddad says, means with sincerity. Yesterday we translated ihtisab uh, as meaning with a expectation for the divine uh, reward. And indeed, this is one of the meanings of the word. And the word sincerity, as he's understanding here, does not conflict with this. Because a person who is sincere to Allah believes that when Allah says that he will reward someone in a particular fashion, then we have no doubt about it. We put our full faith and trust in Allah, and we approach it with full sincerity, believing indeed that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will do. Uh, not because we do the acts for the sake of the reward, we do the, sake, the, re- uh, the acts only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises something, we don't belittle these things, like the Jannah, like the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that for somebody who prays in this month, it will be as if somebody who did X amount outside of the month of Ramadan. These are things that we do not belittle. We don't pray, we don't worship, we don't fast for the sake of the reward. We set fast and pray and do all of our acts for the sake of Allah. We are, we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounty and for the grace that He shows us by means of these things. They are effectively manifestations. It's like one of our teachers um, uh, relates from uh, one of the uh, great ulama and, and awliya of the past centuries of Hassan al-Shadri. He said he used to like to drink his water cold. And when he was asked why, uh, in his time, especially those who were more spiritually inclined, used to uh, revel in hardships upon themselves. So they go out into the uh, wilderness and eat nothing, forage for food. They wouldn't uh, allow themselves to take any donations. So they said, well, why is this? Chilled water at that time was not an easy thing to come across. They didn't have the refrigerators and all the other conveniences that we do. And he said, because when I drink water uh, that is warm, and I say Alhamdulillah, I say it with something uh, in my heart. There's not that. When I drink the cold water, my entire body joins me in saying, indeed, Alhamdulillah. And so this is an indication that the point is neither the pleasures nor the difficulties. Allah is going to give us things that are enjoyable and pleasurable at some times, and He's going to send us, as part of our being humans, everyone's going to have both rough and smooth. But the point being here is that when Allah does manifest His blessings to us, we give true, true thanks for them, and we don't deny them. We don't say, oh, I'm going to be... Um, a bigger Muslim than the Muslims around the block and I'm going to walk barefooted instead of walking with shoes to the mosque tonight or whatever. There might be a moment for austerities, uh, chosen austerities, not the ones the government's forcing Mm -hmm. upon the entire nation. Uh, But uh, the point is that whatever Allah sends us, of rough or of smooth, we indeed turn to Him and say, Allah, we thank you for this opportunity of turning to you by means of it. Uh, And this is where indeed the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that we should look forward to and we should show sincerity and really desire it because it's the Jannah or any of the other rewards that Allah gives for an action is a manifestation of His pleasure. So we don't seek the manifestation, but we recognize that it is what it is. That it's a manifestation, we give gratitude for it. So Imam al-Haddad continues, he said, The fast has etiquette, without which the fast will not be perfected. All right. So he now moves into the section of talking about uh, the etiquettes of fasting, something that again, as we go into the middle 10 days, as we now are, uh, it's a good thing to refresh our memories with. So he says, amongst the most important is to protect one's tongue from lies, backbiting, and falling into that which does not concern you. So this is an interesting point. He begins now speaking about Ramadan, speaking about the fast, not talking about food, not talking about uh, marital relations, not talking about drink, but talking about speech. Because this is one of the first things that after the initial fervor of Ramadan and the excitement of it, you know, the chance to turn towards Allah, when people sometimes fall into the habitual side of fasting, the first thing to loosen is the tongue. People don't you know, say, oh, I wish I could have that hamburger now or whatever it might be. Rather, what they sometimes fall back into is the bad habits of speech. And so the first thing he warns us against, he says, amongst the most important etiquettes is to protect one's tongue from lies, saying that which is not true, Backbiting, speaking poorly of other people in a way that they would not, um, they would not uh, like to hear if they heard it from you. And Imam Nawawi describes this when he defines backbiting. He says this is anything that a person would not like to hear. Not just speaking bad about their character, but even if it has to do with the clothes that they're wearing. Even if it has to do, he says, about the animal that they ride in the days that they rode animal. In our day, own days it'd be saying, look, what, look at that uh, old clunker they're riding. 
right? Even if you mean this in jest, if it's anything that could hurt somebody else, do not say it behind their backs. If you want to jest about the old conqueror, say it to them in their face, and if, they, you know, if they're a close enough friend where they can laugh with you about it, that's one thing. But behind their backs, no matter how close we are to them as family or as friends, one should not say anything that could, by definition, not hurt that particular person, but hurt anyone. Why? Because by your speaking like that, it might be that the people in audience don't know your particular relation. And they then get encouraged to speak poorly about other people. They then, well, so-and-so said it, and they're religious. So that means I, should, I can go ahead and say it. So we don't backbite against people. And as Imam Nawi says, nothing. Not about their deen, not about their dunya, not about their habits, not about the things that they possess, not about their family members. We don't speak poorly about anyone behind their back in any way or fashion whatsoever. And he says, to protect oneself from falling into that which does not want concern one. And this is something that indeed is in, uh, perhaps the entire purpose uh, of withholding in Ramadan, training ourselves to not concern oneself, not to busy oneself with things that don't benefit us. And when asked about this, the automat mentioned what this means is to free oneself of anything that does not benefit you in this world or in the next. So anytime we're about to step forward to do an act, whatever the act might be, we must stop and reflect. You know, this is a, point, a moment for reflection. Is this action going to help me in my akhirah? Is it a form of ibadah that's been passed to us through the Prophet وسلم, or through the communities of, of believers of the, of the Sahab and Tabi'een and afterwards? If so, then Bismillah. So long as it doesn't conflict with a higher priority. Right? So standing in Ramadan uh, throughout the night in prayer, finding time in the day maybe to pray extra rak'ahs in the morning, in the afternoon, excellent. If that means, however, that you're going to fall behind in your obligations to family or to society, in your job, then no, those things take priority at that particular moment. Though Imam al-Haddad will tell us in a few um, paragraphs that one should try to free oneself of all of one's normal obligations to the degree possible in Ramadan to give oneself over to it as, as much as one can. Right, so right now Taraweeh is quite late, so obviously if one can make arrangements to go to work a little bit later in the morning so that one can pray later at night and still get up for support, then, then well and good. Right? Um, but the point being here is that one thinks, this act that I'm about to do, this website I'm about to look at, this book I'm about to look, uh, read through, is it going to help me in my akhirah or in my dunya? And again, benefiting in one's dunya by supporting one's family, by educating oneself, by serving others is a good. This is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks of us. The Prophet ﷺ continued in Ramadan and the companions around him continued in Ramadan sometimes to do the most strenuous of activities. Many of their uh, battles with the, uh, muna, the uh, uh, mushrikeen of, of Quraysh were actually in the month of Ramadan. That being said, we think about this point, is this going to actually help me? Is this going to do anything for my akhirah or for my dunya? And if not, it's something we should leave off throughout our lives. So how much so, more so during the month of Ramadan, which is a training ground for one to control one's nafs and one's habits. Right? It can be very easy to help, you know, people today have addictions of all types, uh, facilitated by easy access to things like the news. We have people who are addicted to the news, you know, checking in every 10 minutes, what's going on? What's going, you know, it's very easy to just whip out a small uh, piece of glass and see what's going on in the world. And indeed, there are moments in which this might be a commendable thing to do. But in Ramadan, perhaps, is a good moment to think, am I doing this too much? Is there really that much benefit in my knowing day to day, hour by hour, what's going on you know, around the world? When in fact, this is a time for me uh, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his, his book, for example, through the Qur'an. So he says, amongst the most important the etiquettes is to protect one's tongue from lies, backbiting and falling into that which does not concern you. And this, all the things I've mentioned right so far have been of the halal, watching the news, etc., you know, reading about them, to say nothing of the haram, of which doesn't concern us. So what did our, my neighbors do the other, you know, and what, what is it? Well, this is not just wasting your time, this is getting into other people's business. What about my, uh, you know, my brother's wife, you know, how could she possibly say what she said to my family? The other? Leave, we leave all of these things in the best of times, but especially in Ramadan. We train ourselves to free ourselves from everything that does not concern us. If you cannot make something right, then it's not your responsibility, you just leave it. Right? Well, my sister-in-law though, she's really giving my mother a hard time. Can you do anything about it? Yes? Then do it in the best of ways and then leave it to Allah. 
No, then just leave it to Allah. It might be that Allah heals hearts in a way that you're interjecting yourself into their problems will only make worse. And especially in Allah. And he says, and protecting your eyes and ears from looking at or listening to that which is not permitted and that which is superfluous. As we said, uh, you know, touched upon yesterday, and as we hear again today, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu warned us about not doing things that will cause our fast to be nothing but hunger and thirst for us. And uh, if we cannot control our eyes, and we cannot control our ears, and we cannot control our tongues, indeed, if we cannot control all of our senses during the month of Ramadan, then how much harder is it going to be for us to uh, do so through the rest of the year? This is a chance in which we get to learn something about ourselves, the month of Ramadan. So we take advantage of that. He continues, he says, Likewise, one should protect one's stomach from consuming anything prohibited or doubtful, especially when breaking one's fast. One should make a special effort to only break one's fast with the permitted. And so this is a good chance as well. As we said in Ramadan, since our, the amount that we're eating, inshallah, is decreased, uh, again, one should follow the sunnah by both breaking the fast and having suhoor. Uh, this is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and all sunnahs, all traditions of the Prophet have a wisdom in them. So we shouldn't say, again, well, I'm just going to go 24 hours without eating. This is actually going against the way of the Prophet At least have a date or some water or something light, fair enough, at one, one or the other. But one should have something at both times. Not, but as we said, this is a time of decreased uh, consumption. So it's a good moment to actually reflect upon what it is that we are consuming day to day. And make sure that there's nothing of the haram, inadvertently. Especially in an age of uh, industrialized food, where you have to read through sometimes a long list of things to figure out what it is that you're actually eating. Things that maybe in different parts of the world at different ages they wouldn't even recognize as food. Uh, maybe it's a good time to learn about these things. Since we're eating less anyways, we can be more careful. We can take it upon ourselves to maybe learn a little bit. One of my own teachers, every Ramadan, recommends a number of books to read in Ramadan uh, of different types. And beyond, uh, of course, his first uh, and most important recommendation to re familiarize ourselves with the Quran, that this is the month of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so this is the most important book. But he says, in between your times of ibadah and as a time of ref as a moment to refresh oneself, every year he recommends numerous books. And every year, amongst those books, at least one of them has to do with health and to do with uh, matters of health and fitness. And why? Because Muslims, he warns us, in our age, have become some of the unhealthiest people all over the world. So this is a chance for us to reflect by eating less, to think about what does it mean actually for me to make my body a vehicle towards the Akhirah, and not just an end in and of itself. To make sure that I'm only doing with my body what Allah wants me to do, striving to have a body that will be a long living one. Because Allah, uh, the Messenger وسلم, commended us to, to have as long lives as possible with the condition that they be for the sake of Allah SWT. So this means what? This means getting rid of all the junk in one's life. Both the mental, spiritual, but also the physical. And so reflecting upon what it is that we eat. And this is perhaps the, second, the reason that he mentions this second in order here amongst his editors. So to refrain from that which is haram, not meaning merely alcohol and, and meats that Muslims don't eat anyways, etc. But also the types of things that perhaps have slipped in inadvertently without our noticing. Um, and so this is a good chance perhaps of simplifying our diets. Learning about what it is that each of us coming from various ethnic backgrounds and different makeups, what is good for my body that might not be good for the next person here in the room. And trying to perhaps uh, rebuild one's schedule of eating, of consumption, of cooking. Uh, around that in order to ultimately please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he continues, he says, Some of the righteous predecessors have said, If you fast, take care about what you break your fast with, and with whom you break your fast. This indicates, uh, Imam Haddad continues, the importance of examination, of muhasabah, of, of reflection, and of scrupulousness, of wara, of not reaching for something until you've thought through, not coming to say something until you've thought through. You know, there's a tradition at, at, at certain points of his life saying that Abu Bakr used to put a stone on his tongue. When he was asked about this, he said because it gives him a moment of pause before he just whips out, you know, the, the, the words that's going to wow the audience. He stops and thinks, is this worth saying or is it not worth saying? Right? And likewise with our food, likewise with uh, what we consume. He says, this indicates the importance of examination, scrupulousness about what breaks, what one breaks one's fast with. 
continues, he, he says, Likewise, the fasting person should protect all his limbs from falling into misdeeds, and after that he should protect them from the superfluous. So this is, of course, the order in which we do everything in our lives. We begin with learning about the, uh, the haram and the halal. We try to get the haram out of our lives, and we try to get the uh, wajib of the halal into our lives, the obligatory, and get rid of that which is forbidden. And then he says, after that, look at, to look at what is superfluous in our lives. Ramadan is, of course, a time in which many people uh, establish their times of giving zakat, which is a good thing to do in order to make sure you don't miss it. You tie it, for example, with uh, the end of the fast. But it's also a good moment to look at sadaqah, by going through one's closet and thinking, do I really need all of these things that I have? Or going through one's household, generally speaking, and getting rid of all the things that, if we really have no use of them, will bear testimony against us. Well, if we actually have good use for them, then they bear testimony for us if we use them in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, likewise, as we said with uh, our habits of eating and drinking, we realize, actually, I don't need to snack every three, four hours. I get on perfectly fine without it. I don't have to be like a child with a bottle of water all the time drinking every five, ten minutes. I can actually get on without it. Right? There's ways of ensuring good health while at the same time not being consumed by consumption. Um, so this, these are all points of uh, reflection. So he, can, he says, by this, he perfects the person who is fasting, perfects his fast and is purified by getting rid of the haram and getting rid of the superfluous. How many fasting people tire themselves with hunger and thirst, yet their limbs go on in disobedience and spoil the fast? Their exhaustion is wasted by that. He, uh, upon whom be blessings and peace, the Prophet Wasallam said, how many fasting person gains nothing from their fast but hunger and thirst? He continues and he says, Avoiding disobedience is a compulsion at all times for those who are fasting and those who are not. But a fasting person should be more careful and so the compulsion is firmer. So understand. Again, a moment for us to reflect upon what every person has their own habits. As uh, uh, the Imam, uh, Imam Ibrahim, Allah reward him in the khutbah today uh, uh, that, that he gave, that he delivered, he mentioned uh, that it is of our very nature as humans to fall, to make mistakes. But he said, the pur he reminded us that the purpose of these mistakes is actually to turn back to Allah by means of them. And this is why many of the great sages of our ummah have mentioned that how many a person through their sin have actually found Allah. And how many of a person through their pious actions has turned away from Allah. By which they mean that a pious action, which is simply a pious action by category, but is not intended for Allah, and thus leads to a person thinking highly of themselves, it could be a means by which Allah is leading us astray. And a sin which Allah afflicts us with, which causes us to become broken hearted, and to make amends for our ways, and to turn back to do tawbah, to Allah can become the turning point in which our lives are changed forever by means of that sin. So this is the purpose of uh, reflection and of avoiding disobedience uh, by means of uh, thinking through these things as people in a state of fasting. Among the etiquettes of fasting is to not sleep excessively during the day. Now of course in our own situation here, uh, one cannot but sleep a little bit during the daytime, uh, considering the daytime is 20 out of the 24 hours. Uh, but the point is, as he said, excessively. All right? And what is excessive for one person is not excessive for the other. Uh, as one of uh, my teacher's teachers in Damascus used to joke, but his jokes were on the way of the Prophet ﷺ, in which the jokes are true. When they used to eat, uh, he used to remind people of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, to eat that which keeps your back straight. And if, if you must, then eat a third with food, leave a third for drink and a third, third for your breath. And then he used to joke, he used to say, and each of you knows how much your third is. In other words, isn't, you know, your third is not going to be same as the third, second person's third. And so if somebody is eating more, that's up to them and Allah. They know what, they, what their third is. Um, but the point here is to, still is moderation, not to go in excess. Okay? To, not, to not end up sleeping more in Ramadan than one would have, for example, out of Ramadan out of the excuse that, oh, I'm fasting and I'm tired. There should be a little bit of exhaustion at the end of the day. There should be a little bit of tiredness. Exhaustion perhaps is the wrong word. There should be something of tiredness. There should be something of hunger. This is part of the purpose of our acclimatizing ourselves so that when the moments come in our life that Allah sends us where you're going to have to be tired. You're a physician, you're a parent, 
you're somebody on a long journey, whatever it might take, that you can be somebody who keeps good cheer in those difficult moments because you've trained your nafs to be able to deal with those things. And this is why, you know, Sayyidina Omar, for example, used to say one of the ways in knowing uh, a person truly is to travel with them because their true character comes out. Uh, or interacting with them in business. But the first point of traveling. Traveling is, uh, as the saying goes in Arabic, it's a, it's a piece of help. You know, true travel, especially in the old days, and even sometimes today, is very, very difficult. And people's true nature comes out. So fasting is one of the ways we train ourselves and train our natures to be able to bear with difficulties. So he says, but rather be moderate in that, so that one feels the hunger, and feels the thirst, and trains the self, weakens the passions, and enlightens the heart. This is the secret of fasting, and this is its purpose, Imam Haddad says. The fasting person should avoid extravagance and excessive passion. By passion here, I imagine the Arabic here is shahawat, you know, the things that we desire, whether of food, whether of drink, whether of marital relations, whether of people paying attention to one, whether of getting one's way, all of these things are from the shahawat, from the, of the ego, the passions of the, of the self. And so he says that the purpose of fasting is to avoid all of these things, to mitigate them, to make, the, to make our aql, our mind, stronger than our nafs, our desires. In this respect, the minimum should be that one's extravagance in Ramadan and out of Ramadan should be the same. At the very, very <coughs> most, I suppose one could say, one should not be more, you know, should not eat more or sleep more or talk more than one does out of Ramadan. If we're doing more of these things, and this does happen where you see people gaining weight instead of losing weight in Ramadan, uh, for example. Again, I don't mean people who have particular health conditions, etc., but someone whose body is generally uh, sound and healthy should be losing some weight in Ramadan. Not in a way that's, again, harmful. It should be balanced, which is why we have the iftar and the suhoor. But there should be something of, of, uh, you know, of the difficulties of fasting, and thus results showing actually on the body. He says, this is the minimum level expected. However, sp spiritual exercise and abstinence from the passions of the self have a great effect on the illumination of the heart, which is specifically requested in Ramadan. So as we stand in Taraweeh, one measure is to think, how much am I actually paying attention to what the Qari is reciting? If this is something where I find my mind wandering, and again, all minds do wander, and it's our job to bring them back to the prayer, to bring, you know, this is the form of spiritual exercise, of exertion, of of striving against the nafs, against the ego, against the talking mind. Right? So what, what is one of the definitions of the nafs? One of the definitions is that it's the, this, you know, the, the voice that you hear constantly, your own voice in your head. You might be sitting with a bunch of other people, but your mind is a thousand miles away thinking about other things. This is the nafs, in one definition. So as we stand in prayer in Taraweeh, if we've eaten so much, or spent our days in ways of heedlessness, we shouldn't be surprised then that when we stand behind the Qari, we stand behind the Imam, and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are being recited to us, that we're not with the Qur'an. If we're with the Qur'an in the day, we'll find ourselves with the Qur'an at night, and vice versa. So again, this doesn't mean annihilating every other aspect of our lives. We have obligations, we have other things that we have to see to, of course, and this is part of the Sunnah of the Prophet but it is a means of reflection. Not to beat up upon oneself, but to say, well, I was half there and half not there in today's Taraweeh. Maybe tomorrow I can figure out why that was the case. Maybe tomorrow's Taraweeh will be better. The point is to continuously be, inshallah ta'ala, with Allah's aid and His help, uh, continuously improving. Uh, just to finish at least this paragraph here, uh, he says, As for those who are more extravagant in their customs and passions in Ramadan, Right? It's Ramadan. Of course I have to have a five-course you know, course meal. I've been fasting all day. Or it's Ramadan. Of course we have to you know, yak it up late into the night. We haven't been talking all day. We've been so tired. Now that we've got some food on our bellies, we can talk until suhoor. No. Uh, he's reminding us that do not fall into these habits. These are the ha habits of the commonality of Muslims. All right? The awam of the Muslimin. Somebody who is mindful of Ramadan should try to go beyond that and become of the elect of the Muslims, which is to say what? Which is the people who strive for the sake of Allah, not just out of habit. And that fact that people have the habits of fasting and the habits of doing, that's, that's good for many people. And we shouldn't belittle that. Better that than what the majority of humanity does during Ramadan. 
but we should take care of ourselves continuously to improve of our state. From that to something higher, to something higher, inshallah. He says, as for those who are more extravagant in their customs and passions in Ramadan than they are in other months, they are in delusion. It's that simple. Deluded by the devil out of his envy of them. He deludes them so that they lose the blessing of their fast and that its lights and revelations do not manifest themselves and they do not feel presence with Allah, the exalted. Nor do they feel humility before him. Nor do they enjoy the intimate discourse with him. Nor recitation of his book or his remembrance. So inshallah ta'ala will end here with these last few points that he mentioned again as barometers. You know, when one is exercising, when one is uh, training for, to be able to, to run a race for example, you go through steps. On day one, I'm going to try to do you know, half a kilometer running, half a kilometer walking, interspersed. Day two, I'll continue that in the second week, maybe I'll add a little bit more running and a little bit less walking. Week three, I'll go an extra kilometer. Likewise with the spiritual life. There needs to be barometers to know where do we stand. And the things that he just mentioned in this last sentence, a feeling that the heart is turned in, indeed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has, has uh, mentioned through His Prophet وسلم, that if you obey that which Allah has taught you, if you implement that which you have learned, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will teach you that which nobody has taught you. Nobody else has taught you. In other words, you will find the sweetness of the, in your heart. You will find knowledges in your heart that are not discursive, they're not by reading. They're by taking what we've read, implementing it, and then finding that I have a different state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one barometer. And the second barometer he mentioned in this sentence here that we can perhaps use uh, in this very evening of ours is our humility. Do we feel more humble or is humility not even on the menu for iftar? That they enjoy intimate discourse with him. So that when we stand in dua, it's not just pro forma dua. Actually, we're finding that with each time, each day of Ramadan, that our dua is becoming more and more heartfelt, inshallah ta'ala. This is another barometer. And finally, as he says in our recitation of uh, Allah's book through our Quran, however much each person, some people are able to read numerous um, khatims, full recitals of the Quran in the month, some people one, some people can read half. Whatever it is, each person according to their circumstances, but the point is to actually find that we're looking forward to it and not just doing it out of habit. Or I'm doing it because oh, it's Ramadan, I have to do it. That's what my family said. Right? These are things that we, these are our barometers, inshallah. Perhaps we can take away this evening and reflect upon them as we uh, move towards our iftar, to our taraweeh this evening, and our, we start our day again fresh tomorrow, inshallah. Until we meet again, perhaps these can be points that all of us can benefit from the words of Imam Haddad from his uh, narrating from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his Qur'an and, and through his uh, noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with that, perhaps if there's a question or two, and then we'll let everybody get on with their evening, inshallah. Is there any questions? No, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned about not letting the mind go on the during the trial. Mm. How is that the highest possible for people who don't understand the Arabic economy? Type. That's an excellent question, um, because even people who do understand Arabic don't necessarily master the Arabic of the Qur'an. So the advice here is both to those who speak Arabic and those who do not. Uh, one way of, of doing so that people have found beneficial is to try to read what you're going to hear uh, in that evening, uh, both as part of your ibadah, which is to read the Arabic, you know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it, but it's, it's for those of us who did not grow up you know, with the language of the Qur'an, and that probably most of us uh, here in the room, even those of the Arabic backgrounds, to also read then a, uh, a quality translation alongside of that. If that means you can't do both, then try to do as much as possible of both fulfilling the sunnah of reciting the, the Arabic of the Qur'an, because it has an effect, whether you understand it intellectually or not in its details, and also to do as much as possible with the recitation of, of the English. So, to make this a habit, you know, of trying to recite what you might hear that night in Taraweeh. Uh, secondly, uh, there's a reward, as uh, Allah has told us, for those who do not know Arabic and thus learn the Qur'an. They reserve uh, and, and stand in prayer and, all of, and uh, stand for the Taraweeh and all of these such exertions. But especially with the, the point of the Arabic that you, you mentioned, uh, it's been related that such a person will receive double the reward. Because not only are they receiving the reward for reciting the Qur'an, they're also reciting uh, and learning the language of the Qur'an, and trying to reflect upon it through translation other, but they're also rece receiving then the, word for the reward for that extra exertion. 
So one should, in one sense, perhaps see this as an opportunity, not as a negative. Oh, I don't know the Quran, I don't know the Arabic of the Quran, therefore, what's the point? This is the way that the shaitan tries to lead us from just giving up. Rather, we should look at the positive side that, yes, it's harder for me, and this is going to lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being even more pleased with me by my uh, taking upon myself to try to prepare myself for the tarawih, to understand what it is I'm reading in my uh, daily uh, word of recitation of the Qur'an. And then finally, when the opportunity arises to attend classes. Uh, you know, here in Oxford, alhamdulillah, Sheikh Thaqib Mahmood through the uh, OTKF teaches tafsir. I believe uh, Sheikh Akram continues to do so, if not in Oxford, through London. And many of the other teachers that we have access to here is uh, teaching in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the exegesis of the Qur'an. So to take this upon of ourselves, if we find in Ramadan, I really wish I'd understand more of what I'm reciting or hearing from the Imam. Well, let's avail ourselves of the opportunities that we have by attending these classes. And finally, to make the intention to learn Arabic. As one of my teachers said, he said, anyone of average intelligence, if they apply themselves, can learn Arabic. If, if you can only learn an hour or two a week, it takes you 20 years, then start now. 20 years will come and 20 years will go and you'll have the language. But if you just say, it's too difficult, I can't do it, it's not my language, 20 years will come, 20 years will go, and you'll be exactly where you were when you started. Uh, so it is not an impossible language to learn. It takes just constant, like any language really, takes constant, constant uh, effort. Even if that means one or two hours a week, that constancy will mean that you'll arrive at a point in which you might actually be more masterful of the language of the Qur'an than many native speakers of Arabic are. And this is not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any, any other questions? In that case, inshallah, we'll end here today. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil azati amma yasifu wa salamun ala al-musaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. The intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates for us to implement uh, what we've heard and to come back tomorrow even further strengthened inshallah. And we'll recite the Fatiha. Just a reminder that tomorrow we're in the Asian Cultural Center and not here.